Hellboy here. We're just letting you know we're doing our thing and doing it good. I have a whip. I use it to get the cattle. The cattle's good. I like the cattle because you can ride cows and then you can hog tie the horses and that was completely backwards. Crimes that rocked a small Brazos Valley town. Three brutal murders. Rumors of botched police work. And accusations of cover-up at the highest levels. I do not believe in coincidences when they happen over and over again. Leaving the victims' families looking for answers. There's someone out there with an answer. And I feel like we are going to get that answer. Find out what disturbing details a News 3 investigation has uncovered. Watch Murder at the Crossroads, Sunday night on News 3's 10 at 10. Members claim both cases are linked by possible corruption at the highest level. Tonight we take a look at the deadly beating of Hank Johnson. Here's part one of our series, Murder at the Crossroads. A pair of shoes, a ripped t-shirt. It's all Sandy Johnson has left of her son. She did not deserve it. She didn't have a chance. Hank Johnson wore these clothes the night he was beaten to death. He was a very, um, he was very trusting. In the summer of 08, Hank Johnson struggled to make ends meet. The young father left his home in Pasadena, moved into a hotel room in Hearn to make a living. <laughs> it's the spinning image of any small town USA. I in the 1900s, it earned the nickname Booger County. Rumors of corruption and conspiracy continue to swirl the streets, keeping the nickname alive. Historic buildings line Main Street and Hearn, many worn down and tattered. A gas station is going in St. Johnson's Motel once stood. The 27-year-old spent his days working as a welder at the Oak Grove plant in Robertson County. His evenings spent playing guitar, entertaining his co-workers. His weekends, helping his mom put on puppet shows for kids. He was always musical, even when he was a little, very musical. And he also did impressions. Hank Johnson's good reputation didn't fit in at the executive end. Police called it a hub for drugs and prostitution. The type of place locals would tell you to avoid after dark. But for Johnson, room 125, was his temporary home. On the night of July 10th, it became a crime scene. You could see where there was blood. Just before midnight, Johnson's girlfriend, Sonny Carter, found him on the floor of his room, barely conscious, barely alive. sitting there, just slumped over his knees. I called the, the front desk. I told him that something had happened. Like Her police roped off the scene while paramedics rushed Johnson into a local hospital. He slipped into a coma and died 11 days later, his mom by his side. What happened that night, that took my heart. And my family's heart. And my heart. Back at the scene, cops questioned several people, knocked on doors, and combed the area for evidence. Two of Johnson's guitars were missing from his room. The assault investigation turned homicide case fell into the lap of Sergeant Steve Stokely, a former detective with the Hearn Police Department. I talked to Steve Stokely, the detective, and he told me right away that he indeed solved the case. Stokely would only talk to News 3 off camera. He says he quickly developed several suspects, including this person, 41-year-old Billy Blackburn. In and out of jail since the 80s, Blackburn's rap sheet is littered with burglary, assault, and police retaliation charges. What's more interesting, his brother-in-law is Robertson County District Attorney John Pascal, a connection Johnson's mother claims is a conflict of interest that led to a cover-up. At that point, I knew something was wrong. I knew it. Pascal would not talk about the Johnson case on camera, but did admit he met with Blackburn alone about Johnson's assault. He told News 3, quote, he's not going to talk to a law enforcement officer, but he'll talk to me. He was never a suspect. Pascal's move eventually prompted Ms. Johnson to file a federal lawsuit. She and her attorney, Juan Pascal, pulled from the case. Lawsuit claims Pascal violated basic investigative procedure, according to the state's rules of professional conduct, because the interview was not witnessed by a law enforcement officer. 
or anyone else for that matter. Ms. Johnson says Blackburn was only cleared because of his connection to the DA. Castle's office eventually cut off communication with her. I am sick with grief, but I am not that sick that I don't realize that I have been lied to. Pascal told News 3 when he met with his brother-in-law, Blackburn unleashed information about another suspect, a man who Blackburn said had a reason to want Johnson dead. 41-year-old Ralph Martinez knew Billy Blackburn and had ties to the motel where Johnson stayed. According to Pascal, days before the attack, Martinez told Blackburn he suspected his girlfriend was cheating on him with a plant worker and said he might need help. Even though the Hearn police were investigating, Pascal questioned Martinez and his girlfriend Patricia Nelson at the county courthouse. According to the DA's report, both Nelson and Martinez admitted they were at the scene the night Johnson was attacked, but denied being involved. The report shows Nelson and Martinez's statement didn't add up. According to Pascal, both were badly bruised. He says, quote, Ralph shows up and sits in that chair right there and is beat to hell. He has lumps all over him. The story is that Patricia Nelson had hit him with a baseball bat. Miss Johnson believes their injuries matched her son's, a possible lead that Johnson claims investigators ignored. I noticed a wood mark on his arm, and I told him several times, I said, there was a wooden grain mark. And he goes, I don't know what that would have been. When we spoke with Pascal about the investigation, he told News 3 he believes Martinez is capable of murder. In fact, shortly after their interview, Martinez took a polygraph test. According to Pascal, he failed. Just when Miss Johnson thought the DA was closing in on her son's killer, another blow. It's really hell. It's really hell. And you don't really let you try the best you can. Uh, I'm trying the best I can. The suspect's sister, Esther Martinez, who admitted to being with Ralph at the motel the night of the attack, was supposed to testify against her brother to the grand jury, but backed out at the very last minute. The move left detectives scrambling for a new lead. They turned to Martinez's girlfriend, Patricia Nelson. Pascal told us this, quote, we decided that we need to get Patricia Nelson because there was hair pulled. To me, that is indicative of a female being involved in the assault, so I figured Patricia Nelson was involved. The day before Nelson was supposed to take a polygraph, Pascal called the Hearn Police detectives heading up the case. Steve Stokely told News 3 off camera that's when he learned Pascal was conducting interviews behind his back. The conversation turned ugly and Stokely hit record. Pick up right there tomorrow night at the clock. In one of those murders, no one has ever been brought to justice. In our continuing investigation, News Story's Jessica James digs deeper into the murder of Hank Johnson and explains why the case not only impacted the family, but also cost one of the detectives his job. According to the main detective, the Robertson County District Attorney's Office demanded he stop pursuing possible suspects in the investigation. A string of events including a threatening phone call from the DA himself, would eventually cause the detective to quit his job here at the Hearn Police Department. It was his favorite song. Mama told me when I was young. The lyrics etched in a mother's broken heart. The title, carved in the headstone, that marks the grave of Hank Johnson. Johnson was a simple man, a welder, a musician, a father, and a son. I cannot stop until I know what happened. In the summer of 2008, Johnson checked into room 125 at the executive inn. The 27-year-old was staying in the Hearn Motel while working at the Oak Grove plant in Robertson County. On the night of July 10th, he was found beaten half to death on the floor of his room covered in his own blood. He never regained consciousness, died less than two weeks later. Former Hearn detective Steve Stokely headed up the case and developed several suspects. According to Stokely, 41-year-old Billy Blackburn was the first. 
Blackburn is the brother-in-law of Robertson County District Attorney John Paschal. Paschal questioned and cleared Blackburn. Blackburn handed over the name of another man, Ross Martinez. Both Martinez and his girlfriend, Patricia Nelson, were covered in bruises the day they showed up at the Robertson County Courthouse. Meantime, Martinez and Nelson were each given a polygraph. Martinez failed. A day before Nelson took hers, Pascal phoned main detective Steve Stokely. It was then, Stokely says, he learned Pascal had already conducted interviews with the suspect. The former Hearn detective recorded the conversation. I think I want to talk to Patricia. But I want to talk to Patricia. Shortly after that phone call took place, Stokely says his former chief showed him a piece of paper with three names on it. The details are laid out in this federal lawsuit. Stokely claims the chief suggested the men work for Pascal as possible hitmen, and that Stokely would be putting himself in jeopardy by pursuing the investigation. News 3 took the allegation straight to Pascal. He would only respond off camera. He jokingly said, quote, if I did, I could sure put them to good use. Before the case was ripped from Stokely's hands, he tracked down two guitars stolen from Hank Johnson's motel room the night of the attack. Stokely traced them back to Trey Thompson. Thompson pled no contest to the theft charges, spent six days in jail for the crime. The police report does not indicate Thompson was ever developed as a suspect in the murder investigation. When we identified those guitars, immediately he said, don't touch them, they're going to the lab. Well, indeed, they never went to the lab. According to Pascal, the evidence wouldn't hold up in court because Stokely used his own money to buy the guitars off the street. <coughs> then, just before Saul settled in, Stokely says all of his reports in the case file vanished. He was demoted and eventually left the department. That October, Pascal's office officially took over the investigation. Without any new leads, the case was shelved. If I have to beg, if I have to plead, oh, I will. Ms. Johnson spent nearly two years hounding police, pressing Pascal's investigators to take samples of blood left under Hank's fingernails. I called and I said, did you? Did you take the blood from under my son's fingernails? And he said, no ma'am. Finally, in March of 2010, Ms. Johnson stood by and watched as her son's body was exhumed. Medical examiners pried open the coffin, gathered possible DNA evidence, evidence that could slam the case shut. Almost three years since St. Johnson's death, his killer remained silent. But one thing is certain, this is about justice and the justice of my son. This mother won't. We tried contacting the Texas Crime Lab to see if they were, in fact, able to extract DNA evidence from Hank's fingernails. They declined to comment. However, according to Ms. Johnson, they entered the DNA evidence into a national database back in May of 2010. It's been almost one year. Still, no results. Reporting in her, Justin James, News 3. And Johnson's lawyer wrote several letters to the Brazos County District Attorney asking that he take over the investigation, and he finally agreed. We continue our coverage with a new case tonight at 10. And if you missed the first part of Murder at the Crossroads, log on to kbtx.com. Well, Ahoy, you skelly